when you're trying to create something real, you need to look at reality. You can't just look at your computer screen. You can't think that you know. You want to be imaginative, and you want to draw from what you've observed and from your reference material and build upon it to create something that's outside of our reality. I wanted it to be a new adventure, you know, bring back a lot of the same characters, and but I, it needed to be a new adventure, a new story, new special effects. You know, I didn't want to rely on old tricks. I had to, you know, take it to a whole new level, make it, you know, not only bigger, but try to make it much better. There's some new car new, new monsters, I think, that'll be kind of funny. The, the, uh, the skeleton creatures that are in the jungle. <laughs> and then the Anubis warriors who, are, who rise, from the, rise from the sand. For the Anubis warriors, we looked at dogs, we looked at ostriches, we looked at, at uh, big dogs, and we looked at all of the hieroglyphic references that we could find. We looked at different kind of fur patterns. We looked at all kinds of mythological renderings, and we looked at every movie that was ever made that ever had anything Egyptian in it. And then we start to build from that. We've got an army of thousands of dog-headed Anubis warriors storming this ancient city and laying siege to it. This is what makes a dog look like a dog. He's got fur that looks like this, it reflects light this way. When he is angry, these are the things that his expressions do. This is what mean dogs look like, this is what dogs that are hurting look like. And we can put those faces on the dogs depending on whether they're winning the battle or losing it. And it, it makes a big difference as, as to how the characters play on the screen. We knew from an early storyboard that the production supplied us with that we wanted to have some of these Anubis warriors climbing the walls of the city and really getting the feeling of an invasion. We started high on the wall and we populated our city with some simple pawns representing the Anubis warriors. And we come down past this tower and to the ground level where the shot finishes focused on the hero temple. And we include the Anubis warrior which then bursts into sand and takes us through this transition to the 1930s. This is where we do our big transition from ancient times to the time that the rest of the story takes place. Where is the bracelet? It's on its way to merry old London. The sequence where the uh, uh, O'Connells are racing through the streets of London in a double-decker bus, fighting hand-to-hand -hand with four soldier mummies. In fact, the same soldier mummies from the first film, the four that were left at the end of the first movie, are the four that appear at the, uh, at the beginning of the sequence in the second mummy. And, in fact, O'Connell reacts by seeing them and saying, Oh, no, not these guys again! We had a fantastic time, again, working back and forth with the realism created by makeup and creature effects and the sort of things that we can do nowadays with computer graphics animation where we can do things that can't be performed by a performer, but they all cut seamlessly together in an action sequence. No, 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 no not my car! Oh, I hate mummies. Back to see me now? Just like old times, huh? Oh. Right! I realize a split second before it hits us that something's coming, and the something that's coming are gonna be these little pygmy guys. Steve is fond of saying, the pygmies alone will be worth the price of admission. Steven was talking about the pygmy mummies pretty early on, and thinking that they were gonna be something that was gonna be in this movie that was completely different from what had been in the first film, but still had that dynamism, that scariness, and that kind of crazy creepiness. So to us right away, we kind of felt the vibe on these guys and the art department went to work. They're gonna be small, they're gonna be mean, they're gonna have big pointy teeth and they're gonna be just ill-tempered and crazed. They're deranged. And this is where we went with it. And Steven was like, yeah, yeah, that's the guys. You know, what are those guys like? And we started to create the drawings and these guys are swinging through the trees on vines and they're, they, they're barefoot and they've got, you know, sticks growing out of their heads because they've been laying around in the bushes for 3,000 years waiting for somebody to walk into their trap. <laughs> and you have these wonderful sequences with uh, Rick O'Connell running along and 
his son's hanging off his back and saying, Dad, look out behind you. And he turns around and here's this crazed, demented midget with a big knife. He's like, whoa! Luckily, he has a shotgun and that's the end of that guy. <laughs> you have this moment that you're now able to create where you have this huge army of live action figures that's now gonna interact directly with 32,000 synthetic warriors. And that's really what we're targeting for. The soldier mummies, the priest mummies, the pygmy mummies, and all these characters. And we bring that complexity together. Now we've got something happening. Now we've got an army that really looks great. It looks great even up against the live action elements. And now you can have a battle. And uh, that's really what we were after. Universal studio head Carl Lemley discovered his niche in the earliest days of the studio. Horror films, monster movies, designed to scare the pants off an unsuspecting audience. <coughs> Nearly a century later, we still remember the haunting images of The Hunchback of Notre Dame and Phantom of the Opera. But it was in the early 1930s that universal horror came into its own. Films like Dracula and Frankenstein thrilled audiences worldwide. The Universal Horror films were some of the greatest films made in that period. Directors like British-born James Whale brought a European grace to these unseemly stories. Cinematographers like German-born Karl Freund played tricks of light to give these films their sense of dark foreboding. And then, in 1932, on the heels of Dracula's enormous success, Karl Lemley enlisted Freund, this master cinematographer, to direct his newest franchise. The Mummy. I can think back to when I was a second grader and began to get my subscription to Famous Monsters of Filmland. And I remember when the cover was of The Mummy and it immediately got taped above my headboard in my room. When I saw that movie, it wasn't just a horror movie. It was also adventurous and romantic and um, really exotic. And it really swept me away. The thing people remember about The Mummy is the first 10 minutes, really. I mean, you're in Egypt, it's the British Museum expedition, and there they are working away on this mummy that they've dug up. And the archaeologists are sitting in the foreground, and behind them is this creature lying there in the sarcophagus. And it's Karloff in the most amazing makeup. Boris Karloff, fresh off the monster in Frankenstein, was brought on to play the dual roles of Imhotep in Ardeth Bay. In real life, Karloff stood only 5 foot 11 inches, and yet he seemed to tower menacingly over the film. I remember as a kid seeing The Mummy and loving the fact that I was seeing Karloff in two makeups. Suddenly, you have Karloff in this, in this incredible old age makeup where you really can't believe he's 3,000 years old. The original movie is absolutely gripping. In the years following The Mummy's enormous success, Universal returned to the franchise again and again with films like The Mummy's Hand and The Mummy's Curse. And then for decades, The Mummy lay dormant, waiting. And then in 1999, Universal was to awaken The Mummy once again. I heard they were trying to make it. I called them up and set up a meeting and went in, I wanted to do The Mummy, because I really had it down, I had the whole story, I just knew what I wanted to tell. It was this big, sweeping, romantic, action-packed adventure movie, wrapped in a mummy movie, if you will. It had horror and humor. Steve shared everybody's enthusiasm for the project and for the task and the adventure of creating a new mummy. There was no question that he was the guy. As grand as some of the mummies have been, this is a very exciting and different one. It's a reinvention of a classic character, a beloved horror figure. We all remember Boris Karloff, and we look towards those productions with a nod and a wink, and you know, we, that's old school, we pay respect to it. The gods will receive into the underworld the spirit of Anxanaman. We're doing a remake of the original Boris Karloff mummy because that involved the character of Imhotep, the priest who challenged the gods and was then buried alive. 
In the core of it, it's about a tragic and maybe even an evil romance, but it's about a romance nonetheless. And what he does, he does for love, even if it means destroying the world. We've created a character who is formidable, fierce, can shape change, can summon the ten plagues on the earth. In order to thrill modern audiences, the new mummy needed to do more than just revisit the past. It needed to carry the franchise into the forefront of visual effects. It's one of the most tremendous efforts of visual effects artists that I have ever personally witnessed. What Island has done is give the mummy an energy and a personality that could not have been done in earlier times. So many people work so hard to bring those ideas to the screen so that Stephen Summers' vision could really become a reality. This new mummy became a box office phenomenon, grossing over $400 million in the summer of 1999. The filmmakers immediately set to work on The Mummy Returns. There was more life in this mummy yet. Within a couple weeks, I started trying to you know, figure out the whole story because I wanted it to be a new adventure. Oh, I hate mummies. It's got more special effects and a lot more action, but it had to be more romantic. And I thought, Brendan and Rachel now are very happily married. They're a great romantic couple. And I thought, why not? They should have a child as well, and we'll, we'll play with that. And that was part of the adventure and story. It just seemed to have been a good progression in character and story. A couple of years ago, this would have seemed really strange to me. You don't want it to be too different, because when people come and go, well, that's not what I wanted to see. But if it's too similar, it's like, well, I already saw that. With the first film being successful, you've got to get that balance right of having the same elements. You can't sort of turn out a completely different film. But the confidence of knowing that the first one worked allowed Steve to be a little bigger with the ideas, a little bolder, if you like. Part of the reason The Mummy Returns works as well as it does is because the entire crews came back across the board. Not only did we have the same cast, the same director, the same visual effects people, we also had the same special effects people and the same creature and makeup people. The Scorpion King is probably the most difficult thing that we had to do on this movie. We wanted to create a truly memorable cinematic creature. Something's got to happen at the climax of the film that is bigger and better and more amazing than anything that has come before. And in this film, for us, that moment was the reveal of the Scorpion King. The films have held a fascination for film audiences because The Mummy is a beloved character. It's part of creating an illusion. That's what the audience comes to see. They want to root for the good guy and they want to boo the bad guy. I think that's what the movie sets out to do. It's fun, it's romantic, it's action-packed. I think it's a roller coaster ride. You just get on and go. And before you know it, it's over. I think it's just very entertaining. From Boris Karloff's Unforgettable Awakening to Brendan Fraser, Taming the Beast, The Mummy lives on into this century and beyond. <laughs>